Hi, friends. I'm here with uh, Dr. Andrew Campbell, a good friend of mine. I think uh, I've known of his work for many times. He's written some great papers on mold and uh, mycotoxins and uh, uh, water damage buildings. Uh, and uh, you definitely want to read some of his uh, research on that um, if you haven't already. And the uh, first time I think I met you, uh, Andrew, was at Aristo's uh, birthday, Aristo Vigiani's birthday. And I heard about you for a very long time. And I know you're editor in chief, alternative therapies and health and medicine. And, and, uh, um, Ari, Dr. Bijanani, it always spoke so highly of you. And, uh, you know, you got to meet, you got to meet uh, Andrew Campbell. You got to meet Andrew Campbell. You got to meet Andrew Campbell. So we finally got to meet and uh, you're such a nice guy. We, we talked a lot of great things and had a great conversation and, and uh, we've been friends since. And I definitely wanted to have people in my community get a chance to hear from you and talk about mold. You've had a lot of experience with mold toxicity as well as, you know, just being a good physician. Before we get into mold, just a quick background about how you got into the specialty and got into medicine and uh, then we can kind of take it from there. So some, some of our people don't know your history. Uh, okay. So, you know, um, I may, I graduated from prep school and I was educated in Switzerland prep school and I graduated uh, a few days before my 14th birthday. And then I came to the States. I did college in three years and then I did medicine. And then I trained initially in surgery and then cardiothoracic and uh, a surgery but then decided that wasn't the life for me and went into immunology and then toxicology and so uh, uh, the first thing that led me to molds was uh, silicone breast implants i saw a lot of women i was based in houston until a few years ago so i was young i established my practice and i saw a lot of women who had the same symptoms I started keeping track of those women, no computers back then, and uh, noticed they had one commonality, which was silicone breast implants, young, old, whatever size, they all had basically a group of symptoms. And so then um, I found uh, a lab at a conference that does testing on the immune system. And that was Immunosciences Laboratories <laughs> and Dr. Vajdani. And this is 89. So uh, before either one of us had a single gray hair. And so we had a long talk and I started using his lab on these, on these women with silicone and we noticed a pattern. So we started publishing studies on that. And we, I think we published maybe 25, 30 studies together and with other doctors on the effects of silicone breast implants. And then I was asked to come to Washington DC and present the data to NIH um, at a big, huge round table. And I did, and then six months later, they banned silicone implants. Wow, that's fantastic. So, you know, I had, had a similar story. I started, I, I met our uh, Dr. Vizdani, Dr. Ar Aristo, who we call him Ari, and we're friends with him, you know, but, uh, um, and he had the, had, he had at that time had uh, silicone antibodies for breast implants. And uh, I remember I called him once, oh, I have a patient who's sick. I think, I think they may have some silicone issues. Of course, test them. And then we tested him and he had neurological anti, she had neurological antibodies. And he's like, they're both high at the same time. What do you think is causing that? And I was like, my 20s. I'm like, I don't know. I'm out of school. Tell me what to do. <laughs> Tell me what this means. And I got that first impression and then it became really relevant that it was a big thing. So, you know, the question was like, um, you know, some people have these reactions and then turns on the, the tr triggering point of a chemical induced autoimmunity and then developing. And then uh, some don't. Now, where do you think we are with breast implants now? Because now they have different types of implants that don't use silicone and uh, there's, you know, hundreds of different chemicals in them. What is, what is your current thought on implants and illness and how do you check for it? What would you do? They still have problems. And, you know, Dr. Schoenfeld in Israel has called this ASIA, A-S-I-A. Okay. And basically what we learned back in those early 1990s was that even women who got, uh, who had their implants removed. Right improved maybe 10%, some of them 20%, but they weren't completely well. Yeah. So I found a PhD in Canada, Montreal, Canada. And since I was educated in French, the English, I, did, I spoke with an accent way back then. 
<laughs> and I found this PhD who really, who did studies on failed implants, chin implants, TMJ implants, knee implants, hip, hip implants, and breast implants. And he would examine them, et cetera, and see what went wrong and give advice to the, how to make them better. Well, I called him and he invited him to Houston and we both had long conversations. And I said, all implants come in pairs in a box with two. I said, what happens when you get one implant ruptured in a woman and the other is still uh, uh, you know, complete, unruptured? He says two things, all implants leak. In other words, if you put them on a piece of paper, any kind of paper and left, leave them there for 30 minutes and then remove them, there's gonna be an oily stain on that paper. So the second part is when he, they've been in the body for a while, the, in, the intact implant actually shows inside this implant floating things, discolorations, green, orange, black, and those are molds. Oh, geez. So I said, well, how do molds get inside? He says, through the manufacturing process. And he had advised all the different manufacturers that their implants eventually have molds and they should change, make, modify how they, they make implants. So I gave these women who had their implants removed an antifungal, itraconazole, spornox, and they all got better. Hmm. So then I started seeing patients who says, well, you help my aunt, my, my grandmother, my mother, my sister, my neighbor. Can you help me? Because we found mold in our home and we're all sick. Right. So that's when I called Dr. Vujdani again, yeah. together with him and says, let's do this and this. What do you think? And so we did and we started collaborating together again on the issue of molds and mycotoxins. Mm -hmm. so just like it happened with the implants you kill off molds 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 are everywhere so you know they're in my this this office or they could be anywhere but until you get them wet and and they don't do anything so if you get them wet and that wet they're wet for 24 hours or more they start to sporulate release spores Hair is 100 microns thick. Most spores are two to three. So they go into the deepest part of the nasal sinuses and of the lungs. And since they go into the lungs, they get to the alveoli, they can pass right on through the blood and circulate and go wherever they want. Now, mold spores are 0 0.1 microns. Oh, wow. So okay. they're the size of a virus. Okay. Like Right. So they get through anything. So let me, let me uh, pick your brain for a couple of things that we all face as clinicians. One is Christian comes in, they're extremely sick, they have an autoimmune disease. And so one of the clinical scenarios is, do I get rid of my breast implants? Would you say, say it's always an yes? If they have breast implants, the, you, you have to demonstrate clinically that that's what's making them sick. Right. So the easiest thing to do is to get a uh, autoimmune panel. Right. So let's say they have autoimmune markers there. Now I know immunoscience doesn't do silicone antibodies, and uh, I remember <laughs> Dr. Vigiani saying, "I just don't want to be in court all day because he was getting dragged in court all day because everyone was getting sick with these implants, and he had to go and be an extra witness and." There was other issues and it became a target and it was like, I just don't want to, they don't want to do this anymore. So he just took, took the marker off because it was completely disruptive to his lab, to his life, to everything. And, uh, and so much litigation was happening from it that he just didn't want that world. But now we're at a point where we don't have markers to check silicone antibodies. And even some of these chemicals are, are not even, there's not even commercial testing for them that are in breast implants. So, you know, the only thing we do have is, for example, the autoantibody markers that they have autoimmune disease. So is there any way to, unrelated to mold testing, but is there any way to test if, if the breast implants are making them sick other than having the expression of autoimmune disease that you think is effective? So the, the tests that can be done now, besides the fact that they do cause autoimmune disorders, yep. so an autoimmune panel, the other test is mold spores 
carry with them mycotoxins. Right. Molds are the gun. Mycotoxins are the bullet. Okay. That make you sick. So you use the mycotoxin test to see if these are actually causing the test because or the disease or the symptoms. Because if the test, the antibody test to mycotoxins is high, well, that is an illness in itself. So the next, next step the clinician has to find out is, is there a mold in your home or workplace? Right. They say, no, we had it checked, it's clean, et cetera, et cetera. Then it's obviously the implant. Okay. So let's say, um... I want to put you in clinical scenarios because we're in clinical scenarios and we sometimes need, you know, someone to talk to about it, figure out what to do. So if we have a clinical scenario um, where the patient has confirmed autoimmunity, maybe they have any antibodies, maybe they have TPO antibodies, maybe they have myelin antibodies, but there's some kind of autoimmune disease that's there. So that's been confirmed. They've been diagnosed. Now the question is, should they get the breast implants removed? The answer is always yes. Yes. Always if yes. it's making them sick. Because by now I've seen maybe, I've seen thousands of people with uh, women with breast implants. I saw many from Hollywood, of course, and from all over the planet actually. Right. I've also seen those who come who have injections of silicone. Right. And, and I think the thing to, to understand is, and the point that you made was, you know, they get the, they get the, the implants removed, it doesn't mean they become cured because the autoimmune disease is turned on. Now, some may have symptom relief, some may not. And then uh, what would you say is the percentage of people that have symptom release? And what would you say is the percentage of people you've seen in your experience that go into a dramatic remission? So here's the key to I mean, it. Yeah. <clears throat> we know about pathogens. There's microbiology consists of four pathogens, bacteria, viruses, pathogenic fungi, and parasites. And uh, all those are living things. They have cell walls, mem cell membranes, et cetera. And the immune system reacts to them in a well-known and well-defined pattern. I had chicken pox when I was a small child. I now have chicken pox antibodies sick circulating in my blood. Am I sick? No. They're just there because I had that infection. Now we're talking about silicone and other toxins. So we're talking about toxins like mercury, silicone, mycotoxins. Those are not alive. They don't have cell walls, they're molecules. So the body's immune system reacts differently to a molecule. And the first rule in toxicology is get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient. In this case, explantation. Yeah. And then there's nothing stimulating the immune system anymore. So then you support the immune system with supplements. Right. But the point is, like, as practitioners, we have to, like, let our patients know. Tell me if you agree with this. You're going to take these implants out. It doesn't mean you're going to be cured. You may have some symptom relief. But the point is you're, you're no longer getting this constant chemical barrage to your immune system. That's one of the things, you know, an autoimmune disease, we're always trying to reduce chemical load is one of the variables that can be promoting your disease. Is that, is that a good way to approach it or to yes. explain what, what, what I have seen in the uh, more or less 14,000, a little bit over 14,000 patients is that once you remove whatever is causing their problem, in this case, silicone implants, but let's say mold in the home or something like that, and you treat them and you give them um, itraconazole it works much better than some of the other antifungals because it's got the best profile and it crosses the blood brain barrier, which is very important. So what happens in this case, and you give them the Spornox and you give them support with supplements, it takes them about two months before they feel, start feeling anything better, any better. And then you continue the treatment Usually within six to eight months, they come into you. How are you doing? It's their regular visit. And they say, you know, I really feel pretty good. Good. Okay. That's when you know you've cured them. Okay. Now, do you think, uh, so you don't have to have leakage, right? Because these, these chemicals are getting through, like you said, um, all together. Do you think modern production of breast implants are still having issues with mold? Or is there a time period where some of the older manufacturing practices were leading to, to mold? 
No, we, we just, we don't know about that part because uh, the implant, the manufacturers learned their lesson and are very careful in any, anything to do with that. And they got really hit bad by lawsuits, lost a lot of the money. And then they were shut down by the FDA. So you can imagine what they went through and now they're very cautious and they're very closed on anything to do with manufacturing or anything like that. You can't find any information until a federal judge, not a district court judge, a federal judge gets them to open it up. So we don't so, know. So, you know, I, I can only tell you that when they do, I had recently a young woman, 23 years old, lovely young lady. She came to me, she was sick. She had the implants put in six months previously because she was going to get a job at a TV station as the weather spokesperson. And she wanted to look great. Fine, that's great, that's wonderful. But she, she got sick in six months, she was very ill. The anti, uh, uh, I did a, a autoimmune panel. She lit up ANA and she lit up um, a, a ANA and RA factors were both positive. She says she doesn't care. She's getting her implants out because this started, she started feeling bad about a month after they put in the implants. She had the implants removed. She got, she f started feeling better. I still treated her. Four months later, she was perfectly fine. Okay. Now, you know, the thing is, is that, you know, we have to be very, like, as practitioners, and I'm sure you've faced with this, is giving expectations, right? So it's like, you, you know, you got to be careful. So how do you handle this discussion? Do you, do you say some of your patients have some outcomes, have some cases where this scenario happened, or is it just wait and let's see what happens? But how do you, how do you have that discussion with them? Because for some women, when they get the breast, you know, some women that are sick, their breast implants and have become the sense of their self and their, their, how their beauty and how they look and they appear. And, and for them, it's a big move to replace them. And, uh, and especially if they replace them and they, they're still sick and they see no change and they can start getting angry at the practitioner. And, you know, that's, that's a very sensitive discussion to have to maintain a healthy relationship with the patient that's dealing with this. Um, what kind of things have you noticed come up with those types of um, relationship issues, practitioner patient issues? Here's what I do. Okay. I tell them, this is the medical evidence. Okay. Okay. So this is what medicine and science has said about this. If you have control over your health, you are the one responsible for your health. So you, I'm just informing you of the possibilities. If you do this, then this, if you do that, then that, etc. You have to go home, think it over, discuss it with your other half or whoever you trust, and then get back to me and tell me what you choose and i have a few articles ready to hand them in a uh, so they can take it home they won't understand it but they will understand the abstract because that's pretty plain and so, you know and i say it's up to you what you want to do but in my opinion and this is just an opinion i don't have the facts yet because i haven't done any testing in you yet if I do testing, I'm going to test your autoimmune system and I'm going to test you for mycotoxins. But go home, think about this, and then get back with me. Right. Perfect. So I want to talk to you about testing. Is testing I mean, very... document this? Yeah. <laughs> right. Of course. Uh, let's talk about mold testing. This is an area where you know there's different different opinions, especially with mycotoxins. So I think uh, when we look at mold, we can measure through antibody or we can measure the myco content, uh, mycotoxin con quantitative measurement. And, uh, you know, the, they're both, one's telling you immune response, one's telling you the presence of some toxin that's in the body. Now, some people have said that mycotoxins and urinary mycotoxins may not be as reliable because you may be ingesting you know, it, mycotoxins with foods and things you eat, it may not necessarily be from your home and from exposure or from some, some, some toxic insult. So those are 
you know, we have to be looking at those with caution. And then we have antibody testing where, you know, you have exposure to mold, which is, which raises antibodies. And then you have people that develop full-blown mold allergy where they have IgE responses. Like that's the general spectrum of, of mold testing as I understand it. What would you, what would you, what kind of input would you give us about mold testing and what you prefer to do? And what do you see the benefits of one type of testing versus another? So one thing is that you and I both know that there's medical science evidence in what we read. Right. You know, it's great to have an opinion. Everyone has that right. We saw that in the last presidential elections, but you have, we as clinicians seeing patients have to base ourselves on what is medical science. So the science says that there is no evidence that urine testing as currently the method they use is valid for other than the parts per billion that occur in urine. For example, uh, Dr. Fry last year, 2021, uh, uh, published a study, Fry and his group, um, uh, on, it showed that 91% of cow's milk, the kind you pick up at the supermarket, has anywhere from one to four mycotoxins. And that 32% has two or more mycotoxins. So does that mean that we should, we should stop having milk? We should stop having ice cream? It's, no, yeah. it's, it's below what is called TDI, tolerable daily intake. That's set in the United States by the FDA, in Europe by the European Food Safety Authority and various other entities. So when it's that small, parts per billion, you just pee it out because urine is an excretion. It's getting rid of stuff your body doesn't want. You have to, I asked a mathematician that I'm a visual and I cannot understand what is a part per billion. He says, take a hundred football fields, cover them with golf balls, remove one golf ball. That's one part per billion. Wow. That's a good analogy. That's a, a great, a great way to visualize this, especially for a guy like me. So you know, when you get two to three or four, eight parts per billion, we do that all the time. I sometimes go like this, my glasses, well, there's all kinds of stuff here yeah. and so on and so forth. So we're exposed to stuff all the time that our, our, our immune system works great. And we both learned that from Dr. Vajdani. Yeah. It gets rid of it. And how does it excrete it? Mainly through urine throughout the day. There's a recent study that came out in 2020 that shows if you really want to know how much is in your food, you need to test your urine for microtoxins four to five times a day. Okay. Because it differs during different parts of the day. Okay. So at breakfast, you might only have a yogurt and that might have a little bit, but at lunch, you're going to have asparagus, you're going to have some chicken, you're going to, and that has more chance of having something. And then it, the evening you're watching tv and you're eating peanuts uh, so so you have to do it throughout the day the other thing is that these the method doesn't is not reproducible in other words um split samples show huge differences whereas the antibody test is very very specific it's like a key and a keyhole the front the key to the front door of my house will not work in to open the door of the your house because it's very specific for that particular microtoxin. And as you mentioned, it's a quantitative test. It tells you what is the body burden, how much. The other part is mycotoxin antibodies are being used by universities. In particular, um, my micro lab just finished a study with Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. Um, another study is going on with uh, Tufts School of Medicine up in Boston, where you studied, got your PhD at Harvard, and then second at Rutgers University, and last but not least, Helsinki, Finland, and they've been in the news lately, but the reason they're doing the test is because Finland has the highest rate of dementia in the world, okay. and studies have shown that in brains of people who have died with Alzheimer's, 
28%, and this is a US study, not a Finland study, 28% died and they had mold and mycotoxins in their brain. Two more studies have come out, one looking at Parkinson's, uh, three studies, one at Parkinson's, one at ALS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis, the other at Alzheimer. In the Alzheimer one, they only looked at fungi they found fungi in all parts of the brain, including the cerebrospinal fluid. In a study on mycotoxins from a completely different uh, university medical center, found that in Parkinson's, all parts of the brain had mold and in the cerebrospinal fluid. In amyotropic lateral sclerosis, ALS, it turns out that, and this is from several publications, Five to 10% of ALS is caused by, because of genetic issues. The rest is due to mycotoxin exposure from an indoor environment, which okay. is huge. So to, to, to go, so the, the amazing information, but to go back to testing. So we can all assume urinary mycotoxins are highly influenced by dietary intake. And there's a difference between urinary mycotoxin quantitative measurements and mycotoxin antibodies. And you, and you, your theory experience have found and prefer the mycotoxin antibody because it's a specific immune response. Is that correct? If you check with the urine labs, none of them have ever been asked by a university to do a study. Right. And, the, and they've been around for a lot, lot longer. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, I have the same thing. We see urinary mycotoxins. We're always like, oh, wait, is this really, is this really toxic mold exposure, or is it just from exposure to, to foods that build up over time, you know, and uh, is this reliable? And uh, I'm, I'm with you. I definitely think antibodies are more reliable. Now, when you look at antibodies, you can measure antibodies to mold species, and you can measure antibodies to mold mycotoxins. Do you have a preference for one versus the other? Well, if you're measuring molds, antibodies, and you're measuring uh, mold as a pathogen, so you could have gone to a summer camp when you were a teenager, been infected there, and now you're fun, and then got over that, and you still have antibodies, just like if you would have had, I don't know, hepatitis or right. something. Whereas if you go to a toxin, once the toxin is out of the body, you repeat the antibody test, and it's all normal. Okay, so the the mold mycotoxin antibody itself is a greater reflection of active exposure, or and whereas the mold species you feel is a, is a better expression of past exposure to mold. It doesn't matter for you if it's IgG, or IgE. Well, I mean, I, one's a, well. Let me take that back. Do you mean, does it matter for you if it's IgG or IgA, or none of those things really make a difference? It's just if it's a mold species then it's just past exposure, but mycotoxins reflecting active levels that are triggering the immune response. Is that correct? Good point. Yeah. One mold makes several mycotoxins mm. and one mycotoxin can come from several molds. The second point is IgG means there's a current toxic reaction going on in the body. Your immune system is fighting this. Mm -hmm. And here's how much it's fighting this mycotoxin, that one, there's 12 mycotoxins. Right. There's over 400 species, 400,000 species of molds, but only 25 affect humans. So in the testing, you're looking at 12. Now the IgG means that, but the IgE antibody, what that does, it stimulates mast cells to release pro-inflammatory cytokines. And these pro-inflammatory cytokines like IL-6, et cetera, and others, will start causing inflammation. And because these cytokines um, affect mast cells, mast cells are near the, the, the regions of the brain. There's outside the brain, but they're near the brain, near the skin, near the opening to organs, you get inflammation. That's why they get hives and things of that nature. So Dr. Kim, yeah. So Dr. Kimmel, so tell us, so you work with uh, Michael Lab, right? You're, you're in the you have, you're ed, you're the medical advisor, advisor there. And they do mold mycotoxin antibody testing? They do 12 different antibodies with IgG and IgE. 
IgE antibodies. The IgE antibodies mainly lights up if you have mast cell activation or mast cell activation syndrome. I just submitted a paper Monday for publication with uh, Dr. Weinstock, who is professor of, uh, at um, Washington University on mast cell activation syndrome using the test from my micro lab, the IgE. Okay, that's very interesting. So when people, when people go on like a histamine free diet, are they really going on a mycotoxin free diet more, more so, do you think? Oh, they're, really just... they're going on a, well, yes, because when you, well, when you, when you stimulate, when you have an IgE antibody or mycotoxins and you stimulate your, your mast cells, mast cells release heparin and, right. and, and all the and histamine and all these things. So if you want to try attacking that by that aspect, it will help for a while. But the key thing, and I think we both learned this from Dr. Verstani, is identify the cause, remove the cause, repair the damage. Right. So once you remove, once you re, re, remove the cause, treat the cause, repair the damage, then you don't have to worry about a histamine diet anymore. Right. Yeah, I see. I, I definitely see the, the point there. So let me let me ask you a couple of questions. You know. In, in the healthcare environment, we definitely have people that specialize in mold. And when you think about, you know, when I, when I mean by that, um, there's people that specialize in mold like yourself that are experts, they publish papers and share the research. And then there's people that I would say, maybe not are experts in mold, but they're mold biased practitioners. What I mean by that is everything is mold. So everything they see is like through mold eyes, like they think maybe they had it. And usually what you see is they had a history with toxic mold impacting their health. And then from now on, whenever they see someone's chronically sick, they think it's got to be mold. Now, if, if that's the case and they measure mycotoxins and a person's eating foods with lots of mycotoxins and, you know, the patient they have is going to the health food store and taking things out of bins and things that have a high mycotoxin content. If they do a urinary mycotoxin test, they're just going to see they're high, which may actually not even be necessarily the trigger of the immune response because they're not actually measuring antibodies, which is the trigger of their immune response. It's just what's what is showing up and clearing out through our urine system. And we all have some degrees of mycotoxins exposure with food, just like we all have some degree of chemical exposures from all types of things in the environment. So that, that really puts, you know, makes it easy to identify a lot of people and come up with the conclusion, oh my goodness, this is mold. And uh, that's probably making you all making you sick. And then there's also the possibility of, of antibodies that relate to expressions, maybe not even current, but years ago, how long do you think the IgG mold species antibodies, not mycotoxin mold species antibodies, how long do you think they stay high for? Once you start treatment. Well, let's say with that treatment, just say someone walks in. Well, if, if uh, they'll stay high as long as they're in the body. So unless not, not, you- But not mycotoxins, but let's say just, if we're making Sachibotrys or some kind of mold species itself. Oh, mold species. Okay, so molds carry, mold spores of, say, Stechibotrys, carry on the mycotoxins. So let's say they colonize in your nasal passages, in your, your sinuses, or in your lungs or someplace. Yeah. Um, then what you what will happen is they will, that will cause an immune reaction. And that immune reaction will have antibodies. So as long as they're still alive, you're going to have an antibody. You're going to be remain positive to the antibodies. But how long do you think for? One year, two years, five years, your entire life? Uh, well, Dr. Ponikaus published a study, head of uh, chairman of the Department of Ear, Nose, and Throat Surgery at Mayo. He took 210 patients to the OR. All of them had chronic sinusitis. He cleaned their sinuses out, sent the material to the lab and asked for microbiology analysis. 96% was mold. And that's a high percent in medicine. He actually petitioned that chronic sinusitis be changed to chronic fungal sinusitis. The point is, is that he gave them two things. One is amphotericin B nasal spray and itraconazole. And they all got better within six months. Now, in another study, they, just, they decided to see 
okay, this patient has been followed for X number of years with chronic sinusitis, et cetera. Now we tested them and yes, it is mold in their sinuses. Well, they start having sinusitis 12 years ago and they're still having sinusitis. They tested for mycotoxins. They're positive for mycotoxins 12 years later. So we know that's the, we know it's 12 years. Okay. I, there are no studies that show 13 or more. There's 12 years is the oldest. Are there any studies that you've done or have been published where we can look at mycotoxin antibodies where we can actually clearly see there, there's treatment, they go down and it's not past exposure? Has that been done yet? Oh yeah, oh, many. Uh, stacks and stacks um and and uh mycotoxin not, antibody reduction post-treatment yeah i mean uh, i have a lot of patients and we're planning to pu publish this before and after we know that mycotoxin igg antibodies form bind to human tissue let me simplify right. bind to human tissue and cause an autoimmune reaction. Right. So we have patients with full-blown psoriasis. We test them for mycotoxin antibodies, they're positive. Six months later, six months of treatment, they're fine. They don't have any psoriasis. Right. And I have photographs if you want me to show them to you, if you wanna. No, I, I, yeah. And then, and then we, we retest them. And they were highly positive, be, before we started treatment, and now they're they're normal. I mean, there's none, nothing. Okay, so you find it reliable to measure mycotoxin antibodies, the way to determine if there's an acute response to mold in preference of urine or actual mold species, and then you find it reliable if the treatment's effective to see those mycotoxin antibodies lower or become negative. No, they're uh, yeah, they're either very very low. And this depends, like the one lady, and she's the mother of a doctor you and I both know and have seen in lectures. Uh, he sent this to me, says, uh, you know, can you help my mom? And so, yes, of course I did and all that. Well, hers didn't return completely to normal because she was a smoker. I see. But I mean, she had low. I have another her patient who's a young woman, very active, married, she's 30 years old, etc. who developed um, the same situation. And of course, they all go and get creams, steroid creams, and all these kind of things. Well, she got well in four months. Right. But she was a gal that went to the gym regularly, was chose carefully what she eats, etc. So those things play a, as we all know, play a role in our health, as general health status. So you gave us a couple of clinical pearls that I really want to touch upon and, and dig some more out of you. One of them was that people that have chronic sinus infections have a strong uh, association with uh, mold-related illnesses. And then people that have mast cell activation syndrome seem to have some mold mycotoxin Ig reactions. Of course, autoimmune disease patients have mold-related issues. Are there any other major groups um, I mean, of course there are, but what are some other major groups you can remind us of that are associated with mold related illness? Yes. For example, I, I mentioned the brain. The brain is the first place that mycotoxins attack. So this is why patients have fatigue, short-term memory loss, um, sleep disturbance, uh, unusual headaches, have to read the same paragraph two or three times to understand it, neurocognitive issues which I, I read this book, it's back here. It's called, Why Isn't My Brain Working? Yeah, I read that I, book. <laughs> and so, um, and because they cause an autoimmune reaction, it's very common to see in these patients abnormal thyroid function. So they're put on thyroid medication and it still doesn't control their symptoms, and you test them for an autoimmune thyroiditis, they're positive. 
these mycotoxins also change the rate relationship between progesterone and estrogen in women and lower testosterone in men. This therefore causes infertility in couples. I can tell you, I have many, many children out there that are called Andrew because their parents came to see me and then they were finally able to have a child. So, okay. So infertility is another major cognitive decline, neurocognitive decline, infertility, for sure. Hashimoto's autoimmune diseases, chronic nasal issues, mast cell activation syndrome. Yeah, I mean, Addison's disease. Mm-hmm. I took, it took a while to get the patient weaned off the, the steroids. And then when he did, we did the testing, started treating him. He doesn't have it anymore. So What's all kinds of autoimmunity. We did a, a, a Jacob Kreutzfeldt patient, and you know how severe that can be to the brain, yeah. and got that person reversed. Really interesting. So would you say it's a mycotoxin antibody screen should be thought of as something with all chronic illnesses, for sure neurocognitive disorders, chronic sinus issues, autoimmune diseases? Because, you know, sometimes the patient doesn't know that they've been exposed to multiple mycotoxin exposures. Sometimes they do. So obviously if they do, and there's an association with, Hey, I lived in this home and I got sick and, you know, and I saw mold there, then the timeline is pretty clear, but for a lot of people, it's not clear. So sometimes adding different protocols and labs is up there, but cost adds up quickly with when you start doing that with people. So what is it a high priority for you? Low priority for you? I mean, you may be a little biased since it's your research, but well, for example, I saw a young, young mother, 30 years old with three little girls. Yeah. And she had SIBO. She showed me the picture. She took in a mirror sideways. She looked six months pregnant. Yeah. Okay. So we did the test for mycotoxins. It turned out positive. She started taking itraconazole. And because she lived far away, three months later, she sends me another picture of her standing sideways to the mirror and her stomach is flat. Nice. So, and I put this in many, many, many of my PowerPoint presentations that I give. So, because a picture tells a lot, a lot more than words. The other thing is, uh, I see commonly patients who have been treated for Lyme disease three years, five years, one woman, seven years. They're still sick. Right. So, do a mycotoxin test because there's cross reactivity between Lyme testing and mycotoxin testing. So right. they, they're tested. And then the other part is many of the tests for limes are IFA, immunofluorescent assay. We've all walked by the ocean at night and see fluorescent things in the water. You walk by the same spot in day, there's nothing fluorescent. Well, that's because light affects it. But these fluorescent uh, tests are done under a light microscope. They're read by a technician under a light microscope. So there's variations. Right. The other part is the best test for Lyme is an antibody test. And it's the only test that is for Lyme that is patented is a test at immunosciences and it costs less than these other tests. Right. The IFA method is 68% precise. That means one out of every three is a false positive, false negative. The one on the done on antibodies is ninety six point six percent accurate. So, uh, so what you mean? So, there's a percentage of people that get tested for Lyme disease may have suspicious positive results, or or be diagnosed as Lyme disease. Um, but some of those may just be cross reactive markers that are showing up because they're cross reacting with. Correct. My mycotoxins. Okay. So why would a patient still be on antibiotics three years later, which has completely destroyed their microbiome? And we know that 80% of the immune system is in the gut. And they still continue with the same, just using different antibiotics. It does it doesn't make sense because if you continue a treatment, you're not getting better. Maybe it's a different diagnosis. Right. So let's talk about the scenario where you do the workup, you evaluate them, you find that they have mycotoxin antibodies, moles are a key trigger for the immune system. Now, 
obviously you want to remove the source. So I want to remove the source. I want to talk about that. I wanted to also go into the second part, which is what antifungal medications you found been very beneficial. And then number three, supplements. So if you can touch upon those, that would be fantastic. So I have, you have a patient, mycotoxin positive. Now what? Next thing is get the patient away from the toxin or the toxin away from the patient, which is the most <laughs> difficult part. I mean, now they've got to find somebody to come and remediate the mold. Now, 50%, and this is in publications and included on the EPA website, 50% of mold in an indoor environment cannot be seen, meaning it can't be seen by the eye. Why? Because it's in between walls. It's in air conditioning ducts. It's in the attic. It's in a basement, et cetera. So you can't see it. So, but mold, mold guy comes and they remediate the house. Once the house has been remediated and you tell the people during remediation, go visit a relative or go visit someone that you haven't seen in a long time, but don't be in the home because that's going to stir up all those, the, the spores. And then you start treatment. What is the treatment? Itaconazole. 100 milligrams twice a day, and you take it with a little bit of food so it absorbs better. You take a bite of an apple, bite of a banana, and it absorbs better. It doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you take it with or without breakfast or dinner, as long as it's twice a day. And it's 100 milligrams, and, you, and if a person starts having issues with the itraconazole, it's usually that's when I tell them switch to Spornox name brand, like nausea or, or heartburn, et cetera. I say, okay, let's switch you to Spornox. And sure enough, they get, those symptoms go away. In the beginning, I used to test them for liver function tests every three weeks. And then nothing happened, so I did it every six weeks. I still ha never had a patient with elevated liver enzymes so I pushed it out to six weeks just so that insurance companies would not start saying whatever they want to say. So I checked their liver enzymes every six, to, six weeks to two months just to be safe. In over 14,000 patients, I have yet to have a problem. The other thing is I want to give them things like phosphatidylserine for their brain. I want them to make sure that they take um, uh, omegas, anti-inflammatories, curcumin, uh, turmeric. Um, I want them to take resveratrol. Um, you have to be careful with glutathione because there is one mycotoxin, it's called gliotoxin, it really affects the brain, that with glu glutathione, it actually causes the, glut the mycotoxin to increase in toxicity. Mm. If they have that, then don't give them glutathione. If they don't have that one, glutathione. And there's various preparations of glutathione that patients can conveniently take. Okay. Um, I like the best one comes in a blue bottle by Apex. I agree. <laughs> but it's really good. It happens yeah. because I look at what patients tell me. Yeah. And they love it because they said within a several days, and sometimes they say, within five days, I noticed it. Um, I'm sure it's subjective, but if it works, I want that for all my patients. Mm -hmm. So uh, glutathione, and then you want to also give them uh, magnesium. I wrote a, published an article on magnesium years ago, and your regular magnesiums that you buy, you pee out within four hours. It peaks in two hours, and you urinate it out. So I use mag SRT, which is a long acting magnesium, but whatever the patient or the, or the clinician wants to give them, that's fine. The, and lastly, I wanna make sure that they take melatonin, about three milligrams is all they need. Studies from University of Texas in San Antonio with Dr. Claudia Miller and others have shown that that is a neuroprotective uh, um, uh, vitamin, if you wish, uh, it's not really a vitamin, it's melatonin. Yes, it'll make people sleep or sleep better, but really it's for a protective element of the brain. Um, 
I want to make sure the patient is on vitamin C. And I don't give small amounts. I give like a thousand milligrams uh, throughout the day, six, 6,000 a day is minimal. And we've all read, or some of us have read Sinus, uh, uh, Linus Pauling's studies. Uh, he's the only guy that's one of the few people who won the Nobel Prize twice. He did a lot of work on vitamin C. There is no toxicity in vitamin C. You can give a million milligrams. It, it can't harm you. Can you believe that? Anyway, but it can, can cause gut issues if you get too high. So you want to get that down too. Uh, get that on board, the patient. The other uh, things that I like to do is if they've got a lot of brain issues, I like to use nitric oxide. Mm. This dilates your blood vessels and gets more nutrients and oxygen to the brain. Um, and uh, got to treat the gut. I use uh, spore-forming bacilli to treat the gut. Dr. Sinus, uh, um, uh, no, Dr. Paul, um, not, not Linus, but following, what's his name? Uh, Simon is his first name. Cutting, Dr. Simon Cutting at Reading University in London did studies on the, uh, on the, on the gut, on the stomach and on um, uh, probiotics. And he found that a lot of probiotics die in the stomach due to the acidity, over 90% because of acidity. So it's best to use uh, something that gets through that acidity and that's spore forming, spore forming bacilli. And really that's it. Now there's, um, and that helps all these patients that are SIBO and are being treated with antibiotics. It's the microtoxins that have changed the microbiome because they all, many microtoxins cause leaky gut intestinal permeability. So when you treat the cause of the intestinal permeability, You're right. guess what happens? The zymline closes up. I've discussed this with somebody you probably know, and uh, Alessio Fasano, um, where I went to school in Switzerland was two hours from where he went to school in oh, Italy. Nice. By train. <laughs> so we, uh, but he talks about, as you well know, Zanulin and all the various issues. And he has said, yes, if you, and I've shown him some of the, the studies and photographs with before and after test results of mycotoxins, antibodies, and he was, he says, yes, that was it. Interesting. So what do, we, what do you think the words of the world come in with, with nutraceuticals that are antifungals like caprylic acid, olive oil extract, regular extract? Do you think they have some use? Uh, they could, do you think they could be used in, in lieu of antifungal medication or they're just not gonna be strong enough? Are you a combination approach? What do you think? Some patients have come to me and they've tried all, you know, like oregano oil, and biocidin and various other things. And there's, and they've tried it for a while, not just for a few months. They've been on it like a year, two years, three years. Yeah. Still sick. Yeah. It takes me at the most eight months to get one, somebody well. A lot of these patients have been on binders. Well, binders, the studies on binders have done, been done on all kinds of animals, sheep, goats, cows, chickens, and piglets and whatnot. There isn't a single study that has been done binders in humans. I can't, so the, I have to go by medical evidence. Right. Not what, oh, I saw a patient that got better. No, because I get five emails minimum daily, seven days a week from patients who've been on binders for two, three, four or five years that say I've been doing this, doesn't, it hasn't helped, what should I do? Okay. What about things that break down the biofilm and dis biofilm disruptors? Do you think those are important to, especially with sinus related issues or what are your thoughts? Only, only if they have very tenacious sinus issues and they don't, they, they're not getting at it after three months, they're still feeling real bad. Then yes. Okay. And then only in sinus issues. And, uh, for people that, let's say their source has been removed, maybe that home radi radiation, or maybe they just moved all together and they go into a protocol like you suggested here. In your clinical experience, what type, what time frame do you start to see things change? I see that most patients 
and this is, you know, it's the bell curve. So the majority within two, eight, eight to 12 weeks really start feeling difference. I spoke to a person last night, he's uh, 61 years old, and it was his 55th day of treatment. And he says the difference is remarkable. So that's tells you for him, it's 55 days, right. you know, a couple of months, it's less than two months. And he was just, he was just thrilled. He had to talk to me. Okay. So to, to, to kind of recap and, and get some last piece of advice from you, I mean, just as a recap, we know that mold illness is a real, real serious issue. We definitely want to suspect with autoimmune disease, things like neurocognitive decline. There could even be IgE, mycotoxin responses to people that have mast cell syndrome, people that have chronic sinusitis issues, for sure need to be checked. Anyone that feels sicker in their home, they leave and they feel better. Those are obviously red flags. Uh, interesting to learn about breast implants that may have uh, mycotoxins in them from the manufacturing process causing chronic illness and so forth. And then um, you can use the mycotoxin test before and after to, to determine if the toxic load is being removed and if it's effective in the protocol. And then you can go into treatment removal, antifungal medication, nutraceuticals, improve the immune system, improve the gut barrier, improve the microbiome, give them antioxidants, and they go through that process. Um, any other key pearls you want to share with us, you think we should know as clinicians working with patients that are chronically sick and dealing with mold related illnesses? Uh, I think it's in a lot of cases, it's a, it's um, a sense of experience. Mm -hmm. You know, the, it's the first 10 will be the most challenging. The next 20 will be less challenging. And after you reach a certain level, you're very comfortable. You know, what's good for a patient that's 22 year old or, you know, and weighs 110 pounds and somebody who's 55 weighs 220 and has hypertension and is a male and you'll be able to juggle these differences, which is why protocols in and of themselves don't work because protocol treats everything the same. Right. So, you know, you've, you use your clinical knowledge of that particular patient. Right. You know, individual. And, yeah. And you use that. I remain open. Uh, my email is immune doctor at gmail.com. And I, I speak to pay doctors in Iceland. Great. New Zealand, India, St. Petersburg, Russia, right. uh, you know, who Cambodia, right. Who call do the mycotoxin testing for their patients. Right. So um, one last thing I want to ask you about is the whole litigation legal world always comes to light if you're working with a lot of mold patients. Patients get sick and they get angry and they're, whether it was their home environment where the builders didn't do the proper setup or if they purchased a home and there wasn't disclosure about mold or maybe it was breast implant issues. I, I, I'm sure you've been dragged into you know, expert opinion for mold cases and other, other types of things. What, what, what do you do when those situations come up? When the patient's like, hey, I'm so angry and I want to do, you know, I'm looking at, I want to do litigation. And how do you get, do you get dragged into those things and, and other practitioners or something to deal with this? What, what's your opinion, advice, suggestions regarding that issue? Yeah, I just say, I'm a medical doctor. I don't get involved in the law. Mm -hmm. That's up to the relationship between you and your lawyer. Just like I'm not going to mix in that relationship. Um, I don't want him to mix in our relationship. Right. But sometimes you may, you may get asked, hey, uh, can you write a letter? Can you give a personal opinion of, I think mold is making me sick. Well, how do you handle those situations? What I do is, again, you stick with the medical science and you say this patient, you know, you do it like talking, if I were to have a patient and I would be discussing it with you, right. this is a 32 year old uh, female who showed up with these symptoms, examination showed such and such, right. uh, our previous medical records showed this and this. Um, I recommended she do such and such tests. These tests showed this and this, and she was treated for those. Okay, so like a very plain and black and white narrative. 
no linear conclusion to any one specific thing, right? Which, which you really can't do. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what we do for, that's what we do actually for right. a living in our minds. Right. You know? So I always end these interviews with asking our experts, what advice would you give to new functional medicine practitioners? What advice would you give to experienced practitioners? I would say, don't use protocols. You know, there's now this new visual test. Well, how do you know that that actually works? Is there any studies that you can watch something on your on the screen of your computer and be tested for? No, somebody's lining their pocket. They're not, there's no evidence that that does anything. So start looking at evidence. Don't look at opinion. There's a lot of great websites out there that hawk all kinds of things, but stick with what medicine and science says for your patients. Don't do whatever weird stuff out there. Right. And, and for advanced, would it be the same thing or people that I'm are sorry. very, would, would we give the same advice for advanced? Is that for both groups? Everything, yeah. I yeah. mean, yeah. I, I, I talk to practitioners who are licensed acupuncturists. Yeah. Um, I have a good friend who's um, a naturopath in California. Um, I actually published a study with him and his dad. Um, a, a double blind placebo controlled randomized study, by the way. Um, I've uh, doctors, uh, you know, um, yeah. ODs, doctors of osteopathy. Um, uh, not uh, um, dietitians and nutritionists. I talk to all of them because it's an opportunity to teach. I've got 100 articles, chapters in medical textbooks, et cetera. So teach. So Dr. Campbell, where can people find more information about your work? Well, you can go to pubmed.gov and right. type in Campbell AW. Don't type in A because you've 16 hundred studies, but if you put a W, which is my middle name, it reduces the, the, the scope, or you can just write to me, email me at immune doctor at gmail.com. And I can, and that way you don't have to pay 35 bucks to PubMed for the copies of the studies. I'll send them to you for nothing. Oh, that's, that's very generous. Well, thank you so much for your time. I think, uh, thank you. Thank you. Good to see you again. Dottis. Thank you so much. All righty.